So my name is Josh Milner. I'm a pediatric allergist and immunologist. Um, my main interests are in studying uh, those who have uh, genetic diseases that lead to allergy um, or um, allergic symptoms or allergic inflammation. Um, both those that are associated with infections like a classical inborn area of immunity and those where the allergy may be the main or only symptom uh, that patients have. Um, I'm interested both in studying those who have known and established causes, um, but also in, in discovering new uh, uh, un, un uh, recognized, previously unrecognized causes for having uh, syndromes associated with high IgE and allergies. Um, and so those are certainly the kinds of patients who I uh, see. Um, I was at the NIH for many, many years where there are lots of uh, folks who also study uh, patients who have um, elevated IgE and um, associated with um, single gene uh, mutations. Um, and recently I've moved to Columbia University um, where I'm doing just about the same thing, just in a different city, um, and um, hoping, hoping to expand uh, the patient bases um, of, of folks with single gene causes for syndromes with high IgE. So uh, the hyper IgE syndromes um, with an S at the end actually uh, can, uh, can be a uh, bit of a confusing subject. And so I think it's great uh, to really address them. Um, the Probably historically, the very first syndrome that was associated with allergy or allergic issues um, where we uh, could come up with a link between an immune deficiency and allergy, um, there was Wiscott aldrich syndrome, which led to eczema. Um, and then there was something called the hyper IgE syndrome, um, which was found in some uh, folks who had abscesses on their skin. They would get respiratory infections. Um, they might get some connective tissue problems. And actually six years after it was discovered, was someone able to actually measure IgE, measure IgE and find that it could be really, really, really high uh, in those patients. Since then, we've found out a lot more about genetic causes of uh, immune deficiencies in general and in, in, in genetic diseases that lead to high IgE. And um, that's really where we have to be super careful um, when we're diagnosing them um, because just saying hyper IgE syndrome um, can mean a lot of different things at this point in time um, since there are probably 10 or 15 or more different syndromes that can lead to high IgE and infection and other types of things that can happen. Um, and, um, and so it sort of um, almost always needs to be that you have to do sequencing for a broad number um, of, of, um, of genetic uh, causes of immune uh, issues. Um, and in fact, you also even look for things that aren't yet known to be associated with high IgE, but you end up finding that certain, a different kind of mutation in a gene that causes, let's say, um, major immune problem with infections alone, a different kind of mutation in the same gene could actually lead to infections plus high IgE or allergic disease um, of, of all sorts. And so um, we really do try to make sure that the first thing when you're thinking about a hyper IG syndrome is to realize it could be one of 10 or 15 or 20 different things. Um, and not just what if, if you look up the classic hyper IG syndrome, which that particular one, which is autosomal dominant. And so you see it in every generation in boys and in girls. Uh, that particular one is um, caused by mutations in STAT3. Um, and, but we've now found multiple other genes connected to STAT3 that could be mutated that lead to something similar. So like the abscesses that don't have a lot of inflammation and easily broken bones and scoliosis and other connective tissue problems, but also the respiratory infections. Um, and then also very, very high IgE and eczema. Although interestingly in, in those diseases, it looks like there are folks who have that are actually relatively protected from severe allergic reactions, because actually that pathway is important in mounting an allergic reaction. 
So there's almost an immune deficiency of your ability to make an allergic reaction in that class of uh, diseases, which is really interesting. And then there's a whole other, other, uh, uh, other group of, of disorders. Um, people have heard of DOC8 deficiency, which was uh, initially thought to be the recessive hyper IgE syndrome. But again, now we know there are lots of different recessive hyper IgE syndromes. Um, but DOC8 deficiency, um, CARD11 dominant negative mutations, um, even with Scott Aldrich syndrome, they are characterized by allergic disease, um, eczema. Um, some of them can get significant allergic reactions. Others are also protected against severe allergic reactions. In, in, in the case of Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, that may be the case. You could have high IgE and eczema, but not necessarily severe allergic reactions. Um, and, uh, and so the allergy uh, reactions might be a bit more pronounced in those uh, particular forms, but also those patients tend to have virus infections of the skin a lot more than those who have mutations in STAT3 or the IL-6 receptor or uh, GP130, which is also called IL-6ST. Um, the ones who have uh, issues like the original hyper IgE syndrome, um, the one, uh, uh, they have far, far fewer um, skin virus infections, whereas the ones with DOC8 mutations, CAR11 mutations, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, and, and a series of others actually um, can be associated with those uh, viral skin infections, and maybe not as much of the connective tissue problems, maybe not as much teeth falling out, difficulties with teeth falling out, not as much scoliosis, not as much with the fractures. Um, and so even just those two examples of, uh, of disorders, um, some of the CARD11 ones are actually dominant, the DOC8 are recessive, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, syndrome is X-linked. Um, those can cluster together with um, the sort of less on the connective tissue side, more on the infection and on the viral infection side, um, and maybe even some more severe um, infections. Um, and, and that's one cluster. And then there, again, there's the cluster um, of folks who have issues in the STAT3 pathway. They have very, very high IgE. And again, there can be a difference in terms of the actual allergic reactions, like to peanut or to uh, whatever else, um, as opposed to what we call allergic inflammation, which would be like the eczema or eosinophilic um, esophagitis. Um, those can sort of show up all over uh, the place. That sort of chronic allergic inflammation can show up all over the place, but those immediate reactions sometimes can separate um, the two. The last point I would also, of course, want to make is that there are some folks who have really, really high IgE, 10,000, 100,000, I've seen 250,000, um, and who may get some infections on their skin. They actually may not have any syndrome. They just have horrific eczema. No single gene is explaining what it is that they have, um, but sometimes they can get confused for a hyper IgE syndrome because their IgE is so high and their allergies are so bad and their skin can get so um, inflamed and infected that um, it creates the concern that it might be a hyper IgE syndrome. And then of course that confusion, if you go and Google it, then you end up saying, oh no, I'm also gonna have this list of issues, um, which again, maybe no individual person would have because they have only one uh, a mutation that only affects a certain set of symptoms and not uh, the rest of the set of symptoms. And that's why it's so important to get that diagnosis um, carefully uh, made and to have a wide ranging set of genes to look for. Don't just look for one gene that could be causing um, a syndrome associated with high, high IgE, which is what I prefer than a hyper IgE syndrome. Um, and, um, and then lastly, in terms of how to take care of these disorders. So the truth is the allergic part of what these folks have very often gets treated like bad allergic disease that somebody down the street who has no genetic problem um, gets treated. They're not all that terribly different from a treatment point of view. Topical steroids for bad eczema, avoiding peanuts. You still can't eat the peanuts if it's caused by a single gene if you're allergic to peanuts, even though other people who don't have a single gene mutation um, and that's, they don't have that same explanation for being allergic to peanuts, it's still uh, going to be an issue. Um, but there are some cases where, there are two special cases where treatment is different. One, of course, is a bone marrow transplant. Um, and if it's necessary to have a bone marrow transplant, usually not because of the allergy, usually, or the high IgE, it's usually because of the infections and the, the, the bad things that can happen from the infections. 
Um, so the bone marrow transplant can happen and that can cure the allergies because you, you're getting a whole new immune system. Although it can take quite a long time, it's, as has been seen, especially in DOC8 deficiency, those allergies can take a while uh, to, to, to go away. Um, and believe it or not, there are some people who get a bone marrow transplant and get new allergies because their donor um, may have had some predisposition to getting allergic disease, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then, um, but, it, but in general, the severity of the allergy probably will go away with bone marrow transplant. And then there are some select few uh, disorders where um, the, the uh, mutation points to uh, a pathway that could be uh, changed in some way. Um, so there's actually a group of uh, um, a primary allergic, uh, pr primary uh, immune uh, uh, issues that lead to allergic disease uh, called JAK1 gain of function and STAT5 gain of function. Those patients um, may or may not have really, really high IgE. They have very, very high eosinophil counts. Um, and they have, can have really bad um, eczema and they also can have terrible urticaria, bad hives from early, early, early on in life. Um, and the reason why you wanna catch that as early as you possibly can is that they're treating those patients with a JAK inhibitor actually inhibits the very pathway that's turned on too much in those patients. So in the case of JAK1, well, JAK1, when it's turned on, if you inhibit, with a JAK inhibitor, it's pretty clear. And then STAT5B is just, is what JAK1 turns on. Um, and so inhibiting that with a JAK inhibitor also can make the eosinophils go down, which is nice, but more importantly, the significant allergic inflammation can, can go away. Um, there are some who were getting infections. It's not clear yet if those infections got better also. Um, but again, they might well be confused for a hyper IgE syndrome in some cases because of how bad their allergies are because of how early on in life um, it is. But in that case, getting the right genetic diagnosis actually leads to what we call a precision uh, treatment, um, which is different um, you know, than uh, obviously different than bone marrow transplant and then different than your typical topical steroids. Now we have dupilumab, which is very, very effective for all sorts of severe allergic disease, including uh, those patients who have um, uh, genetic single gene reasons for their allergic disease. It still can be effective for those. Um, so I'll stop there and I look forward to talking about it more later. No, no, that's, that's actually wonderful. A, a follow-up question to kind of all of this. So if a patient is newly diagnosed, what, what would you like to tell them in terms of what they can expect on their journey with hyper IgE? Um, so um, I, I think one of the most important things is that they need to go to an expert who really um, understands the, that particular disease and understands that particular form um, uh, or cause of a syndrome associated with high IgE um, in the context of the other ones so that there's not a confusion um, that ends up happening. Um, they may end up finding out that they have relatives who have the same thing because some of these there can be wide differences in what different people in the family have as a manifestation. Some people may have no allergy at all and terrible infections. And the other person may have much more in terms of um, allergic disease and very few infections. Um, and so there's a wide range um, that these, uh, these folks can present uh, of, of disease that these folks can, can present with. Um, and so that's why it's really important that they see an, uh, an expert who really uh, knows how to deal with that. But another piece of it is you'd be surprised well, folks, those of us who take care of immune deficiencies, we may not always be up on our allergy uh, treatment, right? And so it's not at all uncommon for someone to see an allergist who can help with their um, allergic disease and also see uh, the immunologist, even though they both took the same boards um, and also see an immunologist um, who can sort of help them with uh, the, the, the genetic picture um, that they have um, and with navigating uh, that, particular, uh, that particular piece. Um, but I, I think that the, the biggest confusion tends to come is, wait, I have a syndrome, but wait, these are allergies. Um, and um, how much of it is the syndrome? How much of it just is, you know what? Uh, a lot of people have bad allergies. You just have the bad luck of getting a syndrome and allergies. And that totally, you know, it, there, there are certain allergic diseases, you know, eczema can be present in a quarter of children. So that means a quarter of everybody with an immune uh, disorder probably is going to have eczema and their immune disorder at some point in time. Um, and there are certain um, other immune deficiencies not as associated with high IgE um, or inborn areas of immunity 
um, which, in, which still make it an increased risk for allergic disease, not quite as profound as the syndromes associated with high IgE, um, but still you can see it uh, coming uh, there. And I think that confusion is where it can be difficult. Um, you also may find confusion, is it pneumonia or is it asthma? Right? Um, if you have really, really bad allergic disease, you might start thinking that there could be an asthma component to what's going on and not recognize you know, that it's not all just the pneumonias that, that, were, that were happening and those can be managed in, in different ways. Um, and again, I, I've certainly encountered parents, patients who folks don't wanna treat with standard allergic treatments because they're, they're worried that this is a syndrome that's really a different thing and it's not really allergies. And overwhelmingly, even if maybe the biopsy of a patient with STAT3 mutation skin looks a little different than typical atopic dermatitis, but we still say to take bleach baths and do topical steroids. And the folks who end up going on dupilumab can do very, very, very well, right? Um, and uh, so, uh, and again, I keep harping on that because that just seems to be a, a very effective treatment that's brand new, um, but it's been extremely effective for severe allergic disease of all kinds, but also in people who have um, genetic uh, specific inborn areas of immunity that are causing the high IgE and the other allergic symptoms that they have. Um, and it's really, really, I, I think that's an important piece um, that I would say is just make sure that side is fully covered. Um, you know, when you go to an, an immunologist who's mostly used to folks um, who have infections mostly and, and, or, or autoimmune issues or other kinds of immune dysregulation only, that allergic piece is rare enough that, it, that it, you know, it's sort of the rare of the rare um, that, that it, there can be some confusion that emerges um, that way. Um, and also another thing to expect is we might check for all the genes that we know that can cause high IgE and not get an answer. That doesn't mean that you don't have a syndrome that is caused by a single gene problem. It just means we haven't discovered it yet. So speaking about discoveries, what is something that this community uh, can expect in terms of research, you know, advances in medicine, what's on the horizon? Um, the more folks who recognize that they might have a syndrome being the cause of their high IgE and allergic disease who come forward to those of us who do research in that particular rare of the rare area, the more genes we're gonna find. Um, we've definitely had folks who never would have thought to go to see someone who deals with genetics of immune problems. They just thought they got the luck of the draw, maybe because it wasn't as severe, maybe because no one else in the family had it and they just thought that was bad luck. Um, maybe because someone else in the family had something much worse and they assumed they had nothing to do with that person. They just had some allergies. Um, there are a variety of different ways that we miss a, a genetic reason why someone is having allergic disease um, because it's, it doesn't necessarily um, look like a typical immune disorder um, that you might see. Um, the more folks who come, we keep finding new reasons for why um, uh, they have their allergic diseases. That's one of the biggest thing. And so something like the JAK1 and STAT5B gain of function, which is just in the past few years that we found it, and patients who've now gone on these JAK inhibitors are incredibly, improved, incredibly improved, several publications um, in that regard, um, that is the fruit of finding a new genetic cause and then actually knowing exactly what to do with it um, and, and being able to treat it uh, in a precision fa fashion. I think that's probably one of the biggest areas that's going to be expanding um, as we continue. Uh, in some cases, it's just gonna be that a good old fashioned bone marrow transplant is gonna be necessary. Some cases we'll never figure it out, but in you know, a good number of cases that's what we're working towards is finding a therapy that has to do with that mutation. Um, and what can we do about it um, that doesn't involve gene therapy or replacing the entire immune system with bone marrow transplant? Wonderful. And my last question, if someone's interested in finding out more information, is there somewhere you recommend that they go? Well, um, again, if they have a, an immunologist who they trust, um, then they should go to that immunologist. Uh, they will have a lot of, uh, it's always emerging, right? And so we always have to look at, we always have to keep up and maybe we've already even missed something that came out a month before and that, you know, we always be on our toes. Um, that's really one of the main 
um, the main uh, uh, resources. There also are individuals who tend to study syndromes as associated with elevated IgE. Um, I have a number of colleagues uh, along with me who, who study um, those, uh, those folks and those are also good resources. So even if your immunologist themselves isn't 100% sure, they can get in contact um, with, um, with those um, who, who specifically take care of syndromes associated with high IgE, including the original autosomal dominant hyper IgE syndrome, STAT3 vari uh, variants. Um, uh, those folks can be an absolute wealth of information. Um, and uh, I believe that the Immune Deficiency Foundation has some publications um, that uh, have chapters in them about uh, these disorders or allergies and PIDs. I'm pretty sure I wrote one of them. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's accurate. Um, and so I certainly, um, that's also an, an excellent resource uh, as well. 